Bokrima Media's Policy, I'm Sane Laminim. Hippai Green is a South African journalist and writer. She joins me today to discuss her latest book titled, A Measure of Our Ills and How We Might Fix Them. So the book addresses South Africa's ills uh, in the areas of employment, um, income distribution, and even inclusive growth. And by the look of things, it will take time uh, to fix them. Does your book aim to provide a deeper understanding of our issues? Thank you, Sane. Yes, look, the book, just some background. The book was compiled from, not by my own research, I did the writing, but it was compiled from a number of papers under the READY project. And READY stands for Research Project on Employment, Income Distribution and Inclusive Growth. And READY was started by the Treasury when Praveen Gordon was there in, I think, his first term. So it was around 2013, 2012. And the idea was to try and gather economic researchers around the country and say, what is the evidence about what causes these problems? And is there evidence about policy solutions? So what I have done is to compile to try and assemble all of the research and to write it in plainer language, you know, plainer than economic language. But the research itself by much smarter people who, who investigate these issues. So in the chapter now addressing unemployment, uh, it discusses the argument that poverty is not only the result of unemployment, but the cause. Do you mind telling us about that? Yes, Murray Leibrand, who's the who was the head of of Ready Three by Three, he's a professor in the School of Economics and the director of Soldry. That because of the legacy of apartheid and because of spatial inequality, in other words, people live far from opportunities, and education is pretty bad. It's actually very difficult for people to come and look for jobs. So the fact that they are poor makes it difficult for them to look for jobs. So poverty and unemployment become a cycle that reinforces itself. And uh, it's not only for lack of looking, but in fact, one of the researchers, Ivan Turok, who's an expert on spatial inequality, found that people actually move to informal settlements, as grim as they are, from rural areas, because your chances of finding a job in an informal settlement is much higher than in a rural area. So the people out on the periphery are much worse off and have almost no chance of finding jobs. So that's where you'll find the kind of poorest of the poor. So poverty and unemployment become a, a reinforcing cycle. And now when we look at uh, another issue that is also big in our country, youth unemployment, it is double that of adult unemployment as we speak. Does this book offer any practical interventions to address a youth unemployment? Well, what I think they did a couple of things that are important. The one is, and you will know from the media, there is a a kind of a myth that on social media and in the mainstream media as well about graduate unemployment. The reason I'm saying this is because of the central importance of education. But graduate unemployment is actually very, very low. The people who are the, have the most, the youth who have the most chance of being unemployed are those without matric. I think it's about two thirds. Your chances of being unemployed if you don't have matric are about two thirds, even with matric. It's around about 54%, so just over half. But graduate unemployment is pretty low. And the reason I'm saying it's important for the media to get right, because if we don't get it right, we don't focus on the right policy solutions. Mm -hmm. So some of the policy solutions are, for instance, to make sure the children either get through matric or that there are better school to work transitions so that children can go from grade 10 into a technical training college can actually learn skills rather than being dumped out on the street the second thing that is important about youth unemployment is what works so there's been a lot of work done on the employment tax incentive and whether it works or not because it costs the fiscus quite a lot of foregone revenue and there were studies that we reported in the book 
it seems the evidence is not very clear about whether it works or not. There's since been another study done that we've published in Econ 3x3 about whether those jobs would have been created anyway by the firms that are creating them or whether they were created because of the tax incentive. But nonetheless, as some of the researchers pointed out, at least in its employment-friendly policy, and one has to encourage the government to look for employment-friendly policies. And then lastly, there are interventions that train people, and there are often NGOs, some with government support. So there is Harambi, which places youth in particular jobs with training, because often the thing with young people is they don't have experience, so they can't get training. And then there's one that I found um, operating in Kailiche here when I was working on the project four or five years ago called Ikamva Youth, which is an incredible program where people who've been through it, university students, offer tutoring lessons to matrix. So they meet in the afternoon in a school, in a library in the, I think it's the community center in Kailiche has a library and tutor, I think it's grade nines and matrix. And apparently it makes a huge difference in terms of getting them through matric. And once you've done that and get a university pass, your chances of getting into a tertiary institution, whether it's a technicon or university are much greater. So they're private and government interventions and one has to see what works. And when you talk about education in the book, it also speaks about our country having now a challenge of inequalities. And it has been evident that unequal education outcomes are the central source of our country's inequality when we look at both income and wealth. Would you mind sharing that? Yeah, so that came from both... Um... I think from Murray Leibrand, but also there's a unit called RECEP at the University of Stellenbosch, which has done a lot of research on education and unequal outcomes. And one of the writers, Professor van der Berg, actually found that the outcomes in education in public schools were profoundly unequal. Because the thing is, with an art at least a matric pass, your chances of being employed are very much lower. And I think that Professor Leibrandt has found and others, his colleagues have found that unemployment is the central factor in inequality, in income inequality, not so much wealth inequality, which is a slightly different animal, but but income inequality, which is what we're talking about in terms of measurement of the great unequalness in South Africa, is driven by unequal education systems. Because if you don't if you don't get a good enough education and you don't get matric and you don't get a good enough matric and you don't get a tertiary edu education, your chances of being unemployed or partially employed are much higher, which means that you your chances of falling into the lowest one, quintile one or two, are very high. In other words, those with, with hardly any income at all in them. Mm -hmm. And I should also just point out our inequality is such, certainly when it was four years ago when I was um, working on this, to be in the top quintile, in other words, to do, be in the top 20%, you need to, you need to earn only 5,000 rand a month. So in other words, can you imagine? So in other words, if you have a job, you're in the top 20%. That is how bad our unemployment problem is. And in the book, I also found uh, an interesting part discussing informal sector trade, which only accounts for 17% of the total employment with 2.6 million employed. What went wrong in this sector? Because I, I also read that in Gauteng, a lot of informal sector traders were also having issues with the with the local government, especially under Park's Dow and there were issues, some were, were even operating for more than 20 years, but uh, they had to stop operating. What are the major issues facing this sector now? Yeah, it, thank you. Thank you, Sonia, for bringing that up. I mean, I think it's really interesting. So Professor Frederick Fareed coordinated and edited a book about the informal sector, saying that at the moment, it you know, it employs more people than in mining. So it is a potentially a source of great employment. 
The problem is there, there are certain obstacles, and you mentioned the one. The one is the legal obstacles, and there have been two, to my knowledge, there may have been more, but to my knowledge, there have been two important constitutional court cases. One, the Johannesburg issue that you're talking about, or one constitutional court case and a high court case, forgive me. When the police raided informal trader stores in, I think it was 2013, and they confiscated goods from traders and, and, and arrested some of them, those traders went to the High Court, the SA Informal Traders Association, and then they went to the Constitutional Court. And the Constitutional Court ruled in their favour, saying that they had a right to make a living. I mean, to me, it was extraordinary that that should have happened. In the in the Durban case, um, a man who had a permit to run his store had left for a few minutes to see to matters of the Informal Traders Association, where he was the secretary, and had left his stall in the in the care of somebody else. And the police came and asked for the guy. They said he was just, you know, kind of a few stalls down. They confiscated all his goods. So they brought a high court case there. The money is kind of, I mean, the amount of money is so little, it shows how much these people struggle. So the they sued the police to return 700 rand, which was the cost of the sandals that they'd confiscated, mm -hmm. slip slops or sandals, whatever it was. But it was an important principled victory because they said that they had to be reasonable about allowing people to make a living. But since then... We know what happened in lockdown and how informal traders just disappeared from the streets under the lockdown regulations, and people really don't have alternatives. So, so Professor Fouri, in his book on the informal sector and the key researcher, pleads for less legal obstacles for informal traders. And of course, there are many. They're not only people who trade on the streets. They're people who are artisans in the townships or carpenters or who run quite big spaza shops. Mm -hmm. And there's there are segments within the informal sector that have to be understood. Some people make quite a good living out of it. But there has to be a, a legal framework that basically accommodates people who are trying to make their own living, a much more, a much more forbearing legal framework. And uh, as much as the book addresses these issues, it also dealt with crime being a factor in this sector. And I hope a uh, government will take note of what was uh, written by your researchers. What are the other issues uh, that this book is trying to address? So crime, crime is definitely is definitely an issue, and a lot of people who I think there were some studies on. What happens in the Cape Town townships? I think there was one in Delft, one in Blue Downs. That people don't have money for insurance, so you rely on you know neighborhood watch and burglar bars and that kind of thing. But there, there are figures in the book. If I can just read you a, a small bit, saying the impact of crime and violence on businesses is uncertain, although it has not seemingly resulted in the spatial displacement of businesses. Crime has certainly impacted on the way that businesses operate. Spaza shops, for instance, have been substantially fortified. So spaza shop owners have got to spend money on burger bars and, you know, iron doors and that kind of thing. So, so but the other the other issues are legal issues about um, trading in town that we've discussed, that there's no access it's very hard to get storage space if you're an informal trader, and that costs a lot of money or to borrow money. One of the researchers, Eddie Rakabe, did a study of informal enterprises in Gauteng in Tembisa, and he found that people couldn't expand their businesses because they didn't have enough room or money to store goods. And then he also found his paper on Tembisa is really interesting, that there weren't linkages to businesses in surrounding areas. So if you, for instance, make chairs, that you can't easily sell them in formal shops in that that might be just down the road in the area. So there are a host of things that policy could make easier. Obviously, crime is not a matter of policy, but you could improve police presence in an area. Mm. 
And while we are discussing all these issues, our country has recently been grey listed. What would you say about that? And do you think it will make things worse for, for such people who are informal traders? I think it's going to make things a bit worse for everyone, um, you know, and for job creation. I, I just wanted to point out one overarching fact that came out of this research, and that's as much as it was kind of government policy for years that small businesses would create jobs. In fact, Neil Rankin said that the big employment Creators have actually been in the ma- in the bigger firms, not in the smaller and medium firms, which means that government has to rethink, in a sense, what it's saying. So the grey listing is certainly going to affect employment creation in those firms. But my knowledge of what happened, the Treasury worked really hard to avoid this all through the Zuma years mm. and now. And the their proposals for the legislative amendments that needed to be in place to avoid the grade listing were just unconscionably delayed by, you know, first the Zuma cabinet and then parliament and then by various others. So it's despite their hard work that unfortunately we have been grey listed and it's certainly going to have an effect on employment creation. It's also going to mean that we borrow money more expensively because our interest rates are going to go up. That was Pippa Green in conversation with Polity, discussing her latest book titled A Measure of Our Ills and How We Might Fix Them.